Hello, and welcome to Fort Edwards. I'm a docent at the Visitor Center of the Fort Edwards Foundation here in Cape and Bridge, West Virginia. Our historic focus is the French and Indian War on the North American continent in the years 1754 to 1760, along with some events that led up to that period, the war's effects and the subsequent history of the community about Edwards' fort. Well, where's the fort, you might ask? And except for a partial mock-up on our back lot, we must admit to the absence of that fort. But what we do have is a strikingly good story about colonial settlement, the war, George Washington, and other interesting characters. And that's why I'm here, to tell that story. But, as with any presentation, we must first set the stage. In 1534, French ships sailed into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and met with some 40 canoes full of Huron Indians anxious for trade, which soon began up the St. Lawrence at the Hurons' camp. In 1541, Cartier brought shiploads of colonists who wintered over at the Huron village. Many of them died of cold, starvation, and illness, and most of the survivors went back to France in the spring. French King Louis XV would not send more excursions, and it all might have ended there, except for the beaver. By then, Indians had long traded beaver pelts for knives, hatchets, cooking utensils, and cloth with the French who came to fish the northern waters. By 1600, the French king decided there was a role for French traders in New France. A colony was founded at Port Royal in Acadia, now called Nova Scotia, and in 1608 Champlain established Quebec. From there, the French, exploring further upriver, discovered the Great Lakes and, crossing them in turn, followed the Wisconsin and Illinois rivers to the Ohio Valley and eventually to the big river which La Salle traveled down in 1682 to the Gulf of Mexico, thereby claiming all the Mississippi Valley to the southern port of New Orleans. They had defined and claimed an arc of influence, a communications route from the North Atlantic across the eastern part of North America downriver to the Gulf of Mexico. It gave them a powerful claim on the land. The English had arrived on the shore of Virginia in 1607, planted a flag, and claimed all the land from sea to sea, without any notion of what that meant. England, a small island and crowded, suffered from surplus population, and life was hard. Many of the dispossessed came to North America as indentured servants, a period of practical enslavement to pay the cost of their journey. Poor people, desperate people fleeing indebtedness, nagging wives or husbands, or criminal activity, all flocked to this new world with great expectations. Whereas the British came for land to establish homes, farms, towns with schools, and other societal benefits, flocking to these shores to make a new life, the French came to exploit, first the fishing, later the fur trade, and eventually commercial goods trade with the Indians. Most French never brought dependents and had no intention of remaining in North America, only to exploit its natural wealth. Eventually, however, some settlers in Quebec adopted their new land as home and began populating Canada. For hundreds of years, Britain and France had been at war in Europe. But by the early 18th century, these two different cultures had coexisted here in the new land for more than a hundred years because there was so much land and they were separated by the Appalachian and Allegheny chains of mountains. But as immigration continued, the British settlements demanded more and more land and continued to push west to where the land was plentiful. They recognized the fruitful French activities of fur trapping and trade and thought to impose themselves into that market. Competition, of course, 
created tensions. And early on, the British also came into conflict with the Indians, for the Brits brought with them rigid notions of land ownership. Once they acquired land, they allowed no trespass or use by others. They acted in the old country manner of land ownership, and when British settlers bought or were granted land and refused Indians even the right to hunt or fish on it, camp on it, travel across it, the strange behavior created hostility. Indians didn't understand the concept of land ownership. How could anyone own land? The land belonged to the Great Spirit who created it. Man was allowed to use it for life purposes, but not to own it. By so rigidly controlling the land, the British cut off the Indians from ancient hunting grounds, burial places, seasonal gatherings, all traditional important aspects of their lives. This put the majority of Indians firmly in camp with the French, for the French held no territorial aims, only use. For other reasons, Indians often favored the French over the British settlers. French men alone in the new lands began relationships with Indian maidens, some even marrying them though they may have left a wife in Bordeaux. And the French Catholic clergy's proselytizing of Native Americans was less coercive than that of the Anglican Church. But mainly, it was the trade between Indians and French that built interdependence. By the 1730s, tensions were rising between the two cultures. Men had crossed the mountains on horseback and afoot, and though they hadn't found passage for their wagons to transport families, still they encroached on Indian-French prerogatives. At this point in our narrative, we need to pull together several disparate threads of history to provide context to the ultimate development of events. In the 1730s to 40s, Joseph Edwards moved his family to a 400-acre parcel of land in the Cacapon River Valley here in what was to become Cape and Bridge. From Chester County, Pennsylvania, he brought with him a wife and three sons. A daughter was born here after the family's arrival. Edwards was a wealthy man in terms of possessions and land back in Pennsylvania, and we don't know why he left the community near Philadelphia with doctors, schools, and churches to come to this uncivilized, dangerous frontier. But he settled on his land, building a house, barn, and outbuildings on the river, and he prospered. In 1748, a group of wealthy, influential Virginians, including Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie, the Virginia Patriot George Mason, George Washington's two elder half-brothers Lawrence and Augustine, Thomas Lee, and others, formed the Ohio Company of Virginia a commercial enterprise, and petitioned the Crown for a land grant in the Ohio country, an exceptionally fertile area. King George II granted them 500,000 acres, 200,000 immediately, and another 300,000 if they settled a 100 families on it within seven years and built a fort to protect the settlers. When the Ohio Company began selling off parcels and the buyers showed up to build and live on the disputed land, denying others access, the Indians and French reacted as one would expect. Tensions were heightened. George Washington, born in 1732, had, by 1748, finished the schooling expected of a well-born gentleman of the period. He had his numbers, could read and write a decent cursive hand, had some rhetoric, and was ready for a career. Not the eldest son, he did not get first inheritance. His elder half-brother, Lawrence, inherited Little Hunting Creek Farm on the Potomac, later renaming it Mount Vernon, after British Admiral Vernon, under whom he'd served in the Royal Navy. George wanted to go to sea, as Lawrence had done, but his family was convinced that the young man must find some other field of endeavor. He'd shown an interest in surveying, 
and as he had a little geometry in addition to his numbers, he had an edge. He took instruction in Fredericksburg, Virginia, but had really settled on nothing. George lived at Mount Vernon with Lawrence's family. Their nearest neighbor of comparable social standing was the William Fairfax family, who owned Belvoir Estate nearby. Fairfax's daughter was married to Lawrence Washington, and George was popular in both families. Thomas, 6th Lord Fairfax, Baron of Cameron, in Great Britain, a cousin of William Fairfax, owned 5.2 million acres of land in the Virginia colony, but was not profiting from it. Desiring to develop the land for sale, he enlisted cousin William in a plan to have it surveyed. William dealt the task to his own son, George William Fairfax. In family discussions of the impending work, George Washington learned of it and, thinking it great adventure, asked to go along with George William, whom he was close to. The families agreed, and in 1748, at the age of 16, George Washington first came to this area as the party traveled west into the wilderness to oversee the start of the surveying development project. This lead party was only in the wilds for a month, but young Washington was exposed to many new wonders and adventures, saw game he'd only heard of, encountered Indians. He crossed mountains and wild rushing streams and lived off the land. It was a grand adventure, and once the surveying job was put in place and en route back to Belvoir, the small party spent the night at James Cody's home in this area. Washington wrote of this visit in his journal, a practice that was to stand him in good stead in the future. Washington was so attracted to the surveying life and the future it offered, he returned home and after training and surveying in Fredericksburg, Virginia, was certified. He later became the official surveyor of Culpeper County. But he was not satisfied to lay out quarter-acre lots in the town. He was ambitious, wanted to gain wealth, and he knew money was to be made out west in the Fairfax lands. He returned to this frontier area and worked, surveying for some three years. When Washington's brother, Lawrence, died from tuberculosis, Washington left surveying and returned to Mount Vernon to manage the estate for his sister-in-law. But when she and her children died of disease in 1752, George became owner of Mount Vernon at the age of 20. In an act of noblesse oblige, Lawrence had served as an adjutant in the Virginia militia. George, wishing to do right by his inheritance, submitted himself to the governor as a candidate for that same responsibility. But the Crown had decided that the colony of Virginia was so large and its functionary elements so demanding that responsibility should be divided for better control. At one time, Virginia stretched from the lower reaches of New York Colony south to the northern boundary of Spanish Florida. The militia was divided into four commands. Washington was appointed adjutant of the smallest of these. So by 1753, at the age of 21, George Washington was a certified surveyor, the gentleman farmer owner of Mount Vernon, and an adjutant major in the Virginia militia. At this time, the major sticking point in the two powers confrontation was the question of who owned the Ohio Valley. Several earlier European treaties failed to clarify specifics about the Ohio country. France claimed it as part of their territorial staking out in the earlier moves up the St. Lawrence, across the continent, and down the Mississippi River. Britain claimed it from their original 1607 claim of sea to sea. No one addressed what that left for the Indians. But only when English settlement pushed their frontiers west across the Appalachians did the issue become truly fractious. The French felt threatened by incursion and a fear that the English would encroach on their Indian trade. 
and when settlers who bought land from the Ohio Company sought to settle on it, the French, using their Indian allies as willing surrogates, reacted violently and forced the settlers out, threatening them, destroying crops, animals, homes, and farms. Like any customer sold a useless product, the evicted settlers went back to the Ohio Company for a refund. This threatened the entire scheme, and Governor Dinwiddie stepped in with overt political power to salvage the enterprise. Advised that the best way to deal with this dust-up was to send a strongly worded message to the French establishing the English king's claim, the governor would command the French to get out of English territory. Seeking a courier, he learned of a young gentleman who not only had experience in the wilds of that frontier as a surveyor, but was also a major in Virginia's militia. Dinwiddie called in Washington and asked him to undertake this task. The young man, anxious to prove himself, to make a name for himself, and there was opportunity for financial gain, readily agreed. On October 30th, 1753, Washington left Williamsburg, traveled north through Fredericktown, now known as Winchester, crossed land that would in the following year become Hampshire County, Virginia, and arrived at the Ohio Company's post at Wills Creek, where the creek spills into the Potomac River on November 14, 1753. There he employed four men as servitors to handle logistics, make camp, handle the horses, and so forth, along with a trader who spoke several Indian dialects. He also took on Jacob Van Brahm, a 24-year-old ex-soldier Dutchman, as a French interpreter, and gained the critical services of Christopher Gist, an experienced trapper, survey, and woodsman. Gist owned land in the area of the expedition's objective, the French headquarters in what is now western Pennsylvania. The new Fort Le Boeuf was one of a string of forts the French had begun erecting as early as 1750 and was to be headquarters for French forces in the central region. Quebec was the main focus in the east and New Orleans in the south. It was to the commander at Le Boeuf Washington was to deliver Dinwiddie's ultimatum. From Wills Creek, the party took the Nemacullen Indian Trail west arriving in Logstown on November 24th. There, Washington, Gist, Van Brahm, and the Indian-speaking trader met with Tanakarison, a Seneca chieftain known as the Half-King for his strong Iroquois affiliations and influence. His second-in-command, Monacatusha, also known as Scarasadi, and other friendly Indians. They discussed trade, friendship to the English, and Washington engaged some of the Indians to accompany his party to Venango, the French advance post. The French officer in charge at Venango could not address Washington's mission and referred him to the French commandant a few miles further on at the recently erected Fort Le Boeuf. Arriving there, Washington, after a courteous reception, presented the letter from Dinwiddie, which, in essence, told the French, Get out. French Commandant Le Gardier de Saint-Pierre said he would forward the message to his commander, Governor Duquesne, in Quebec, but that he would in no other way deal with the English demands, and he would defend his position to the best of his ability. Saint-Pierre let it be known that his fealty to his most Christian king, Louis the Fifteenth, was immovable. Washington could do nothing, but while there, took careful notice of French defenses at the fort and later drew up a map. His mission completed, after some delays, he and his party began their return journey. Along the way, Washington visited the forks of the Ohio, where the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers joined to form the Ohio River, and noted that the critically sighted position needed to be occupied by British forces and defended. Washington, anxious to report to Dinwiddie, decided his party was moving too slowly, 
He and Gist went on alone afoot to Williamsburg, sending the others with the horses and most of the supplies to follow. They returned through Wills Creek, Frederickstown, and eventually to Williamsburg, where Washington reported the French rejection of the governor's demands. In questioning his young emissary, the governor noted how precisely Washington recalled the French commander's exact words. Washington produced his journal, and when Dinwiddie realized that Washington had so well captured the haughty, dismissive tone of the French, and interpreting that as a slight to the English king, the governor had the journal printed up and distributed to the House of Burgesses, and later abroad to Great Britain, using it to generate support for fiscal appropriation and the authority for military action to drive the French out. Dinwiddie then asked his young major to head up a punitive expedition to rid the British colonies of the French. Washington, perhaps for the first time assessing reality, agreed to serve the colony however he might, but that as he had no military training or experience, it would be wise to choose a more experienced leader. Dinwiddie chose Joshua Fry, a scholar and old soldier made him colonel of the expedition, and made Washington second in command, promoting him to lieutenant colonel. In the interim, while all this travel and discussion continued on the east, the Ohio Company had sent a team of carpenters and woodsmen to the forks of the Ohio, responding to Washington's report on the value of that location. They were to build a fortified trading post, establish a solid base of trade, and draw the Indians away from French influence. Receiving intelligence of this bold move, the French sent a large contingent of soldiers and Indians who drove out the smaller British presence, took over their fledgling efforts, and turned the structure into Fort Duquesne. That fort became the command center for the central region. So for Fry and Washington's punitive expedition, Fort Duquesne was now the objective. Colonel Fry, leading the British militia force, set out from Williamsburg in the spring of 1754, marching north through Fredericktown, northwest across Hampshire County, on to Wills Creek, pressing toward Fort Duquesne. The governor wanted quick movement, but the force was incomplete, all recruits necessary not raised. En route, Fry ordered Washington to take a force of some 300 men and, with Gist's guidance, proceed to Great Meadows, make camp, and await the remainder of his forces, while preparing for assault on the French further west. Fry would hold at Wilts Creek, establish his logistics base, and await arrival of the remainder of the troops he'd been promised, as well as fresh horses and further supplies to supplement their current meager lot. Washington, marching his troops west and north, reaching Great Meadows, looking out over the muddy, unlikely ground, made his most naive and unfortunate comment. This is a charming feel for an encounter. He set his men to work, laying out their tent ranks in a gap between two small gullies. His lack of military experience is evident in his selection of what was possibly the worst site ever chosen for troops to defend. The ground, mostly in a depression, was surrounded by rising slopes, large boulders, and trees. Excellent cover for an assaulting enemy force. It was late spring, and heavy rains had made the ground into a bog. Work was difficult. Washington was advised by courier that French forces were on the march with no good intent for the Brits. Within three days of reaching Great Meadows, Tanacharis and the half-king sent word of imminent danger. Shortly, an Indian runner arrived who brought word that he had discovered an armed body of French camped in a small glen not far away. They were likely those whom the half-king had warned were on their way to attack Washington. The young officer, determined to avoid ambush, chose to advance to meet the French. With some forty men, they marched through a cold, extremely dark, rainy night, 
following the Indian scout, accompanied now by Tanakarisan and a few other Indians, to the site of the French camp. It was only six miles from Great Meadows. Washington's force came upon the presumed hostile troops just as dawn was breaking. The French, camped in a narrow defile overhung by sheer rock walls and higher ground, were just arising, some of the men still in their blankets. Fred Anderson, author of A Crucible of War, the premier work on the French and Indian War, devotes the entire foreword in his book to describe what happened. Paraphrasing his words, Washington set about deploying his men along the high ground, looking down into the French camp. The sun was just rising, and a French sentry spotted movement, raised his rifle and fired, alerting the French to an attack and killing one of the British militia. With this shot, the Virginians opened fire in a volley directly into the cramped spaces of the French camp. After a sharp exchange of mere minutes, the French raised a white flag of surrender. Washington, Gist, Van Brom, and the half-king and some braves went down into the glen to parley. The French commander, Ensign Coulon de Jumonville, wounded and lying on the ground, asked why the British had fired upon their peaceful group. When accused of moving to assault the Brits, the French officer replied that they had simply been on a diplomatic mission, carrying a message for the governor in Williamsburg. He produced an official document, purportedly to that effect. Written in French, the paper did nothing to ease Washington's mind. He had no French. And he caucused with Gist and Van Brom, his interpreter, poring over the document. While Washington was engaged, Tanakarisan confronted the wounded Frenchman, saying, Thou art not dead yet, my father. The term father was ironic. In the Indian culture, they referred to most European officers as my father as one who would lead them and teach them. But it is also relevant that the half-king's father, formerly a chief of the Seneca, had been killed by a French-led Indian party. Donna Carison had long-standing enmity against the French. Upon speaking those words, the Indian killed the French officer with a tomahawk blow to the head, whereupon the other Indians attacked the remainder of the French wounded, killing all ten. They would have killed the remaining 22 prisoners in the same action, but Washington stopped a massacre. His intention was to return them as prisoners to Williamsburg, as sources of intelligence against the French. This so-called Jumonville affair, or the affair Jumonville Glen, named for the French officer, occurred on May 28, 1754. It was the opening shots of the French and Indian War. Washington, realizing they were only a small band deep in enemy territory, ordered a roundup of the prisoners and a move out for Great Meadows. In taking count, they found only 21 French prisoners. One had disappeared. One young private, half-dressed and barefoot, escaped the formation and ran 60 miles barefoot back across mountains and rocks and forests to Fort Duquesne to spread the alarm. Once his absence was realized, Washington hastily retreated to Great Meadows. There he urged on his men to complete the defensive positions, assuming the French forces would be close on their heels. In fact, it was some five weeks before the French appeared. But even so, the Virginians had little to work with. Colonel Fry and the remainder of the expedition had not come, Tools were scarce, food and medicine critically low, and heavy rains hampered their work. Under the threat of retaliatory assault, Washington knew he must rapidly build a defensive position. They erected a small log stockade, 53 feet in diameter, and inside one small shed, 14 feet square, under a skin and bark roof in which to store their meager food, gunpowder, and a few kegs of rum. Most of the defenses were trenches dug outside the stockade. These quickly became pools as the swampy ground and continuing rain 
filled them to the chest of their defending militiamen. But they hunkered down and waited in what they appropriately named Fort Necessity. They were short of food, medicines, gunpowder, almost everything but rain. And Dinwiddie's promised resupply was still just a promise. They waited five weeks. A young Washington sat and waited to be attacked, as he knew must happen. But Washington, inexperienced and young, was still a good soldier. He'd been ordered to go to Great Meadows, establish camp, and await the arrival of Fry and the other forces and supplies. He did as ordered. What he didn't know was that shortly after the force split and Washington advanced to Great Meadows, Colonel Fry had fallen from his horse, was mortally injured, and died soon after. Ironically, Washington had been in command all along. Washington's force was enlarged with the arrival of two other companies of the regiment. The Hat King had brought eighty to a hundred Indians, though many were women and children, and some were sick or invalided braves. Several days later, Captain Mackay marched in with a hundred South Carolina soldiers, along with some sixty head of cattle and flour, powder, and ball, which added greatly to Washington's stores. During June, Washington moved his central headquarters to Gist Plantation, just 13 miles away. But after a period of conflict and assault by enemy forces there, he withdrew to Fort Necessity. There, on July the 3rd, the French, some 400 strong, found them. Predictably, the Indians and French took up positions behind the boulders and trees on the high ground surrounding the fort, and began raining fire down on the defenders. Within three hours, Washington had 130 men killed and 70 wounded. In a heavy rain, already low on powder and ball, and what gunpowder he had got wet, the militia could not effectively defend themselves. As their own troops suffered similar privations, the French offered a parley. The French commander admitted that they had attacked as a retaliatory action for the deaths at Jumonville Glen. The French pointed out the facts to Washington. He was in a poor tactical position, his men in water up to their chests, low on food, medicine, shot, and powder, and with no hope for relief. The British could attempt to hold out, and the French would just continue potting away, killing their men and under siege conditions they would die of sickness and starvation. Or they could surrender, and the French would allow them to march out in proper military order with their colors and weapons, excepting, of course, the cannon swivel guns. Only after signing a pledge not to build a fort or trading post on French soil for at least a year. Washington saw he had no choice. With the advice of Van Brahm, who read the French's proposal and misinterpreted the language, the British commander signed it. The French kept their word about the release, but part of the deal was to return the French prisoners taken at Jumonville, and to ensure that two officers, Captains Van Brahm and Stobo, were held by the French as hostages. Washington later learned that the document he signed had characterized his surrender as an admission of assassination in the killing of the Jumonville troops. This document, with that particular language, was later used to good effect when, in 1756, France and England declared war on each other's sovereign nations, and France sought to inflame its allies to join their just cause. From necessity, Washington and his surviving troops returned back to Wills Creek and thus back to Williamsburg in a humiliating defeat. Governor Dinwiddie saw that militia forces were unequal to the task of stopping the French advance in the Ohio Valley. He appealed to King George II, who sent to Virginia Major General Edward Braddock and two regiments, the 48th and 44th Foot, from occupation duty in Ireland. Braddock was 60 years old and had served 45 years in the Army, entirely in the Coldstream Guards, 
a premier British regiment, but he'd never experienced combat. He was arrogant, pig-headed, and uncompromising, and totally unsuited for fighting a frontier war. He thought the European style of engagement was the only way to make war. March in column to the site of engagement, deploy in lines, and fired each other until a clear indication of victory was evident. He would not countenance any of his troops fighting in the frontier style, using cover and concealment and ambush as a means of overpowering an enemy. Braddock's two regiments were at low levels of manning, depleted after years of occupation duty, and they were without proper training and preparedness for the wilderness. A campaign to recruit, train, and equip this force was begun in Williamsburg, and the regiments were gathered in Alexandria. But when the force stuck out for Fort Duquesne in late May 1755, it was still not up to full strength, and was short on horses, wagons, drivers, and men. Braddock moved north to Fredericktown, then northwest across the corner of Hampshire County to Wills Creek, rechristened Fort Cumberland. After consolidating his forces and resupplying, on June 9th, the 2,200-man force moved on toward the Three Rivers Junction site of Fort Duquesne. Disdaining the Nemacullen Trail, Braddock cut a road through forests, over mountains and valleys, to allow movement of his carriage and wagons, primarily to allow passage of the heavy guns he was bringing to lay siege to or to destroy the fort. These 12-pounders required up to nine or more horses to tow one gun in its ammunition cart. A group of 30 sailors accompanied the Army troops, sent to work block and tackle gear to haul the guns up steep slopes and over chasms en route to the assault. A large body of men chopped down trees and smoothed the way, and sometimes the Army could move only two to three miles a day. It took a month to make the trying journey. En route, Braddock stripped Colonel Dunbar's 48th of its best troops, joining them with the best of Halkett's 44th to create a new flying column, which could move faster and, hopefully, better attack the fort upon arrival. The less qualified troops and much of the supplies, wagons, and detritus of the combined two regiments followed. In addition, there was a company of horse, a company of artillery, a company of marines, and a scattering of independent companies enmeshed in the force. Out front of all was a 300-man advance party of scouts led by Lieutenant Colonel Gage. The French, through their Indian allies, always knew Braddock's position and progress. When his leading force of some 1,300 men reached the Monongahela, about six miles from the fort, having already crossed the Snaking River twice that day, they suddenly encountered an enemy force comprising some 250 French troops and officers and 600 Indians. It was a surprise encounter for all, not an ambush per se, as often characterized. The French and Indians, local Shawnee, Delaware, and Iroquois, and Canadian tribes, Wyandotte, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, better adapted to wilderness warfare, were moving on higher ground, and they opened fire on the regiment. Captain Beaujou, assigned to be the next commander at the fort, leading the 850 or so men, had volunteered to meet Braddock and slow his advance. The French knew the fort could not stand up to Braddock's heavy guns, and they were in the process of evacuating and destroying the fort. Beaujou was just a delaying tactic. The regiment got off one good volley at the outset, killing Beaujou and others, but when the British regulars could not deploy in line as they'd trained to do, confusion ensued. It was July. The weather was hot, muggy, and this was before the days of smokeless powder. When a gun was fired, there was a cloud of smoke. When 2,000 guns were fired, it was a veritable fog bank of obscurity. The Brits could not see their enemies. They just knew they were getting cut down. The Indians and French, on slightly higher ground, 
had a better view of the conflict, and using Indian tactics of firing, moving, reloading, and popping up to fire from a different site, their fire was devastating. Colonel Gage lost control of his scout troops, who panicked and fled, leaving behind two cannon undamaged, which the French captured and turned on the British forces. Chaos reigned as the Indians, overwhelming the troops, attacked the supply wagons. They began pillaging, and their break-off of the assault is likely responsible for the larger number of British troops who survived. Within two hours, nearly a thousand of Braddock's men, including sixty officers, were hit, killed or wounded. Later, it was determined that much of this carnage was deemed friendly fire, that is, friend killing friend, due to panic, inability to see, and being trapped in Braddock's constrained tactics of standing and firing in ranks. The British officers, on horseback, in their bright red tunics, with silver gorget on their chests, made excellent targets. Soon, leadership was effectively neutralized. After having four horses shot from beneath him, General Braddock was shot through the chest and fell. Colonel Hallett, 44th Regiment Commander, was dead. Colonel Dunbar, 48th Regiment Commander, was not up to his role. Washington, who had accompanied Braddock as an aide, took command and managed to extricate the remainder of live British troops. Braddock was loaded on an ammunition wagon in the retreat. He died on the road four days later and was buried in the road, his body many years later discovered and moved to his present burial site above a section of Braddock's Road. Retreating to Fort Cumberland, Colonel Dunbar in the 48th foot continued on to go into winter quarters in Philadelphia in July. The 44th foot, eventually rebuilt, continued to serve in the French and Indian War. But with the destruction of Braddock's force, comprising not only regular British troops, but also many men who had served in militia units, there were no defense forces left to protect the Virginia frontier families. Indians, under the leadership of the Canadian French officers, used Braddock's Road as an easy route to move eastward from Duquesne and attack the settlements. Many families were killed, homes burned, crops destroyed, stock stolen, and women and children made captive and taken away. Most settlers abandoned their lands and fled east, back to Fredericktown or south into the Carolinas. Joseph Edwards, his wife and four children, refused to abandon their home. With his sons and neighbors, Edwards built a palisaded stockade about his house and outbuildings where he and his few remaining neighbors could take refuge from rampaging Indians. He had a spring at his back door and his home backed on the Cacapan River. There's evidence Edwards's fort was attacked at least once, perhaps more, but it was never taken. In the fall, 1755, Washington was named Colonel, commanding the Virginia Regiment. Implementing a joint plan with the governor and his advisors, he envisioned an arc of forts reaching from Fort Cumberland in Maryland south to the North Carolina border. He began building Fort Loudoun in Winchester to serve as his headquarters. Edwards's fort, or Fort Edwards, became an important link in this plan as it stood one day's ride west of Winchester and provided security for troops on the march between Forts Loudoun and Cumberland, the main logistics base for the Western forces. Along that route, a second day's march west led to Pearsall's Fort, now Romney, a third day to Fort Ashby, and from Ashby, a final day's ride or march brought them to Fort Cumberland. In the spring of 1756, a force of about a 100 Virginia regiment troops were marching from Fort Loudoun to Fort Cumberland and had bivouacked at Edwards's. In the morning, they moved on north but found the river at high flood and they could not cross. They returned to Edwards's and bivouacked a second night. Early the following morning, on April the 18th, 1756, a soldier went out to check the horses and spotted an Indian at the forest edge. The mission of this body of troops was to find and destroy these bands of Indians, 
So the soldier reported to his commander, and the officer immediately sent out a party of about 40 soldiers to try to follow the brave, hoping he'd lead the troops to a war or hunting party. And he did lead them there, straight into an ambush. In a brisk, deadly battle, the Virginia regiment lost 17 men. The commander, Captain John Fenton Mercer, Ensign Thomas Carter, and 15 soldiers. That encounter became commonly known as the Battle of the Great Cacapon, or Mercer's Massacre. It was the largest, most deadly conflict on the Virginia frontier during the French and Indian War. In the ensuing months, conflict in the immediate area diminished. The war moved on, north and east, across Maryland and Pennsylvania, eventually up through New York and Canada. General Forbes, in 1758, cutting another road to the target, took a mostly destroyed Fort Duquesne. He renamed it Fort Pitt after the new British Secretary of State. It's now called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The French and Indian War, which took place in North America, ended in 1760 when British General Wolfe defeated French General Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham outside the heights of Quebec, Canada. This ended the French claim on Canadian provinces east of the Mississippi, which all became territory of Great Britain. The related and overlapping Seven Years' War, fought in Europe, the Philippines, India, the Caribbean, and Atlantic, continued on until 1763. Joseph Edwards and his family remained on their land. He eventually added to his 400 acres by purchasing five more plots of from 240 to more than 400 acres each for his children who married. Some moved away, others' names were lost to marriage, but Joseph Edwards remained a community force as settlers returned to the Cape River Valley, some anew, some starting over. Later, other families and individuals owned this property, and it was continuously occupied and farmed up until the late 1980s. The original residents, outbuildings, and remnants of the stockade all faded away. The white two-story house located near the site of the original fort was estimated to have been built in the 1810 to 1820 era. It's possible that it contains hand-hewn timbers from the original Edwards home. In 1995, a proposal to build a multi-structure townhouse development on the known site of the old fort from way back prompted the creation of the Fort Edwards Foundation to bring attention to its existence and importance of this historical site which begged preservation. Ultimately, Cape Bridge Town Council ruled that the town could not provide sufficient water and sewage service to sustain the development. The developer, stymied in his plans, put the land on the market. The foundation, with grant money and funds raised locally, purchased the critical 13 acres containing the site of the home and the fort of Joseph Edwards. The foundation was later able to purchase an adjoining 10 acres to the south, so that the Fort Edwards Foundation now owns 23 acres between Cold Stream Road and the Cacapon River. In 2000, with additional grant funding, the Visitor Center was built, opening to the public in 2001. Programs and displays were created for operation of a Visitor Center. A school's program was consolidated to offer entire classes an opportunity to bask in their historical antecedents. The Visitor Center is open to visitors from mid-June to early in October each year on weekends, with the Visitor Center manned by docents. An expansive bookstore, which also sells maps, recorded period music, and other items of the period, has become a major part of the operation. Many descendants of the Edwards family, now spread to the winds, are members of the foundation, often coming to visit on holidays, vacations, and family reunions. Others interested in the fascinating history and culture of this period are members and visit regularly. Ask the on-duty docent for information about membership. The Foundation sponsors several fundraising events annually. 
to help maintain this all-volunteer, not-for-profit historical foundation, whose reasons for existence is to preserve, protect, and interpret the site of Edwards's fort. See our pamphlet or go online to our website, www.fortedwards.org, to find more information about these events and other activities at Fort Edwards. Thank you.